The South Carolina Gamecocks with yet another big opportunity at williams Bryce Stadium as they welcome the 10th-ranked Texas A&M Aggies to the field on Saturday night, helping us break it all down. Talk South Carolina. Good friend of mine, good friend of the show, Chris Marler of Locked on Gamecocks. He does a fantastic job covering that South Carolina program. Chris, appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure to have you on once again. What's up? Yeah, somebody that's been a lifelong – you know, fan of South Carolina and, and has really had their finger on the pulse of South Carolina athletics as a whole um, for as long as you've known me. I mean, one of us has, and it's definitely not you. So um, I'm obviously kidding. Yeah, man, it's going to be on here. It's been been a minute, but it, there is a – this has been a really fun, fun week, and I'm nervous for Saturday for South Carolina and, and what what's to come. But I, I think there's a really good opportunity there, man. Mm. Yeah, it's another big opportunity, Chris, to your point at home. We've seen a few of these this year for South Carolina. They've come close, and some could argue maybe should have gotten a win or two more than they've gotten. Thank you, SEC refs. But either way, you sit at four and three, two and three in conference. Carolina coming off the big win over Oklahoma in Norman, and of course, coming off the bye week. Chris, just give me your biggest takeaways on this South Carolina team to this point. Because to your point, Chris, I don't think you and I have actually talked since the preseason. And we all had kind of our preconceived notions and thoughts on what this team would be, what year four of the Shane Beamer era would look like, what success was going to be and what it needed to be. Uh, Just your overall thoughts on this team through seven games, the positives, the negatives, things that have surprised you. uh, What stands out to you going into the final month of the season? Yeah, man, to to your point, we haven't spoken much this season. Listen, all you've done is become like the the new, actually knowledgeable SEC Mike, which has been really nice. just bearded SEC Mike as you're none around our condo here. Um, and to you know, to be fair, it's hard to be in constant communication with me because I lose a Twitter account every three weeks now. So um, just very, we're trending in different directions. I'll say that. Vern Dumquist is fitting, though. I'll give you that. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. <laughs> um, anyway, so no, the, the South Carolina stuff, like going into the season, I was very adamant that this team – was going to be a top five defense in the SEC. And I think people thought that was crazy. And you've seen it kind of play out. They're only four and three. To your point, they could easily be five and two. You could also look at that old Dominion game, and it it could be much worse, right? But what has been most impressive is Clayton White, a guy that that people, some people wanted gone uh, after last year. Going into the season, South Carolina has had the most takeaways out of any team in the SEC in the three years he's been there. They have continued doing that this entire season. It's one of the strengths of the program. They're very opportunistic. They are great up front. They're obviously great off the edge. I don't think anybody thought they would be that good off the edge. Um, you know, they had 20 total sacks last year. They have 28, I think, right now or something like that. Um, the secondary is a strength. The secondary has been – I knew it was going to be good. I didn't realize it was going to be this good, and especially the ball hawking and, and the, like, you know, not just turning or creating turnovers, but creating turnovers into points right away is been something they've done throughout the entire season. Um, not easy to do. The – that being said, going into this game, if you're a South Carolina fan, you are hoping that whoever you're playing is going to be dumb enough to throw the football 30, 40 times a game. Like, look what LSU did. And if it wasn't for the refs, like, you know, Nussmeyer had several like turnovers in that game that, that could have been game changers or game enders. A&M's not going to do that. If, the, if there's one thing we know about A&M, it's their head coach looks like Grimace. And two, they are going to run the football over and over. That's their entire identity. They run the football 63.7% of their plays. You saw it a week ago against LSU. I do think this AM team is a little bit inflated in terms of how good people think they are. The schedule hasn't been super great. They lost that home game to Notre Dame. They barely beat uh, Bowling Green. They, you know, kind of eat by Arkansas. They eat by Mississippi State as one and seven. But in the moments where like the most eyes were on them since that Notre Dame game, they balled out. Right. Like they, they crushed Missouri and then they came in and, and obviously took care of LSU with that huge comeback or come from behind win. It, it can South Carolina load the box. Can, can Nick even worry? We've seen how great he is in, in, in pass coverage. Can he come down, play in the box, take away the run? Um, Cause that's the strength of the defensive unit, but like they also need to make sure that they are able to establish some sort of consistent offense because that's the biggest question for South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chris, on that note, again, the defense has been the talking point because of guys like Dylan Stewart, Kyle Kennard, uh, Demetrius Knight, Debo Williams, Eamon Worry, John Kilgore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's been a fantastic unit, I think, 13th nationally in total defense. I mean, the job they've done has been incredible. But you mentioned on the offensive side, and of course, you've got the numbers. Yeah, on the offensive side, 
how do you feel like this offense has progressed? You've seen flashes from Lenora Sellers, but still obviously you've also seen times where, hey, he's a young quarterback and he looks like that. Uh, offensive line has continued to be an issue for them in regards to protecting the quarterback and I think establishing any sort of consistent run game. It kind of still feels like you're looking for that proven weapon on the outside. So, again, Chris, going into this football game and going into the final month of the season, is the offense just kind of is what it is at this point, or is there hope that they can turn it on in the final couple games? Yeah, they they are like a toxic X, man, that offensive line. They just refuse to block anything. It is un- – like – it's just been so bad. Even the Oklahoma game, you get nine sacks from your defensive line. You give up seven. Um, it's second worst in the country. It, it, and this is an a and defense that is, you know, they don't like blow you away with how good they are at, at getting to the quarterback necessarily, but they are constantly in the backfield. Like it is as good of a front four in the SEC as there is, including Ole Miss, including, you know, uh, Georgia and all that kind of stuff. Like they are very, very big, very physical and and like one of one type athletes in this conference. So that does worry me because, because listen, I feel like Lenore Sellers has started to turn a corner. You saw it in the Alabama game. Um, I think he played turnover free football at Oklahoma. It was a weird game at Oklahoma because they were up 21, nothing in the first nine minutes. So it's like, what do you expect out of the offense? Like you're, you're at that point, you're just trying to go home, right? Like you want to get out of there without any injuries and get a win. And, and after halftime, especially it was like the offense felt like it kind of sputtered at times. The thing I keep going back to that was most impressive this entire season, I just dog cussed Dowell Loggins after the performance him and Beamer had at Ole Miss, which is a concern mm-hmm. because you're off a bye week and you're at home, which is exactly the situation they're in this weekend against AM. And they played themselves and took themselves out of that game within the first 10 minutes. The fake punt, bringing in Robbie Ashford on a, you know, the RPO that ends up being fumbled all inside of your own 40, just really dumb, inexcusable stuff. Dude, they went out against Alabama. And Lenora Sellers, no one expected him to throw the ball that much. He did. He did it well. No turnovers. Highest completed percentage or completion percentage of his career. He's turned a corner in that aspect. Emma doesn't really get to the quarterback in terms of, of sacks, though. And he has shown time and time again that he will make some really dumb decisions with the football and not protecting the football. And if South Carolina does that and allows AM to get the ball in their own territory, like they did against LSU, it's going to get ugly quick. It'll be it'll be like Ole Miss if that happens. Chris, before we dive in this A and M game, I'm just curious. Again, you have covered South Carolina on a daily basis throughout this season, so you've really gotten a good gauge on the pulse of this fan base, a fan base that is passionate as any across the sport. What's the vibe and the mood of the fan base going into the final month of the season? Again, four and three overall, two and three in conference. You've still got the Wofford game out there. You still play Vandy. A game like against Mizzou looks a lot more winnable than maybe it did in the preseason. Heck, this oh, A&M a game, this A&M, yeah, this A&M game is obviously winnable too. And then you got the, the series or season finale against Clemson. And I mean, they beat up on the sisters of the poor. So who knows what can happen in that game. So getting to a bowl game and even then some is still very much achievable. But like you mentioned, been kind of a mixed bag. Defense has been really good. Offense is sputtered. I know there's some, a lot of mixed feelings on Dabble logins and just maybe where the program is in year four. Like what's the overall vibe of the fan base in your mind going into the month of November year four of Shane Beamer? I mean, it is a battered fan syndrome mentality. It is constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I get it. Like, you know, like, I mean, the, listen, that LSU game I think was really, really big. It could have been a really big program defining win that would have been up there with the Tennessee win from, from two years ago. Like it, I think it would have done that sort of level of confidence to like for them to keep going because there's games on the schedule you were never supposed to win. If you talk to anybody in the outside media going into the season, it was four and eight, mm-hmm. four and eight, five and seven. That's the ceiling, right? Which seems very, very foolish. I don't think every South Carolina fan wasn't really on board with that. I think like it, it's a very pessimistic fan base that has been let down time and time again. So more than anything, what I want to see this weekend, I don't want to see them have to be in a situation like we saw at Ole Miss where it's like, you have an extra week to gear up for it. You have an extra week to prepare. You get them at home in Williams Bryce at night. Every single possible thing that you could possibly want from the setting and scene is in your favor. Mm -hmm. Please don't let them down. Cause like you you might not win this game. I I will tell you one universal feeling is I wish that everyone talking about this being an upset special would shut up. 
Like I wish that people around the country would stop talking about it because South Carolina is at their best. They're a lot like Auburn in this way. They're, they're at their best when they're kind of like lying in the weeds and, and jump up and get you when you're expecting the least out of them. There is a lot more confidence in the team, especially defensively. They are going to ride or die with sellers, and, and he's really their only option there. But it is very fickle, man, as you know, because I saw this with Kentucky. I saw it after LSU. They put up 50 against Akron. Even me, after the old Miss game, I was like, Dow Loggins needs to be gone right now. And he's responded like like the way dude the way they attacked Alabama coming out of the second half of that game, where they they had like a sixteen play drive and ran it thirteen times like at will like they the shovel pass like the the route concepts with like the slot phase like he's been better, it, you know it's I don't want to get their hopes up too much but this is a winnable game for South Carolina Vegas sees it everyone else sees it like you know A and M's coming off of everyone's patting A and M on the back right now everyone. Especially each other. That's all they do. It's just a bunch of boys singing along in a campfire. <laughs> 107,000 Boy Scouts just loving life. This needs to be a, a raucous environment in Willie B that is not like there for fun, but is like out for blood. And to your point, Chris, it's interesting. I think since the summer, people have called this a trap game for AM, circled this one. And it's to your point, if you keep calling it a trap game, it becomes not a trap game because it's been called a trap game so much. So to your point, yeah, yeah, South Carolina, anybody that knows this program knows you love to be in a position where you're sneaking up on somebody, you're not being talked about, you come up kind of like you you were going into Kentucky, where it kind of felt like everybody and, and the Tennessee game and some of those years past. Yeah, for sure. Um, speaking of Texas A&M, Chris, when you look at them specifically and the matchups in this game, and I know you've broken it all down, things that give you concern from the South Carolina perspective of things that like A&M does well that you've seen to this point, and maybe there's some areas that you think South Carolina can exploit and take advantage of that, you know, maybe A&M, uh, there's some weaknesses there, just areas for opportunity for the Gamecock. Yeah, you're going to have to figure out a way to to not have them crowd the box. Like, I mean, the worst stat in the world, one of the worst stats in the world, South Carolina, let me make sure I have this right. South Carolina is like seventh in the country in rush attempts per game. They're like 93rd in rush yards per game. That is awful. Like they run the ball the seventh most times in the country. They gain like the 37th fewest. It's it's really bad. I think that they need to figure out a way to at least take some shots deep. AM's, you know, a bit of defense that's allowed, I think the, they're second to last in the SEC in, in, in yards or 30 plus yard pass attempts or in, in plays. Um, you cannot be a bend but don't break defense against this team either because when they get to the red zone, they are lethal. Like they, they lead the SEC in red zone uh, scoring offense. I think they're like fourth in the country. They're also like 15th in red zone defense, which is another thing. So like you cannot give them a short field. I do think that this is, like I said earlier, an inflated A&M team because they they are good. They, the resume itself and that that zero in the, in the loss column is unbelievably impressive, especially in year one under Mike Elko. But – Marcel Reed is a freshman, right? Or he's like a, a second-year player. Mm. He's a dual-threat guy, which you see every day in practice. I hope they bring in Wegman because it would be a mistake, for one. And then, two, Wegman is not going to beat this team. Like, like mm. the things that he does well, South Carolina does at an elite level. So the biggest concern I have, man, is a young, off, not a, a young left tackle on an offensive line that has been really, really bad without a lot of improvement. Can they give Lenore Sellers time to throw the ball? Can they keep him upright? And if they can't, does Dow Loggins have a like you know a, a game plan for making sure they can still get plays of positive yards? Because that's another thing with South Carolina that they've done well in the last two games, but well, a shit job in the first five or whatever. Being in like third and nine or longer is it's like it's almost every series, mm -hmm. and it's that's that's something you cannot find yourself in with this defense because the one thing that A and M definitely has right now is confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to figure out a way to take that away early, man. Chris, you just mentioned it, but key or keys to the game for you for South Carolina, if the Gamecocks are going to finally score that what feels like at least signature win of the 2024 season, key or keys in your mind that South Carolina has to do to get the job done? So I think they got to they got to get ahead early. I, they cannot be in a position where they have to come from behind. Um, I keep saying this: you got to learn a lesson. Shane Beamer has to show that he has learned a lesson. Same with Dowell Loggins. Dowell Loggins has shown it. That like 
I was so impressed with what that offense looked like after the, the Ole Miss debacle when they went to Tuscaloosa because they had a plan in place. It was very unfamiliar with what they had run all year, and it was the best they had looked consistently throughout 60 minutes, um, and that was on the road. The biggest thing for South Carolina, and, and it's so cliche, but it's also so true when you look at the numbers, winning the turnover battle. You have to be even or plus in the, at the turnover margin in this game. Under Shane Beamer at South Carolina, they are 20 and six when they win or they are even in the turnover battle. When they lose it, they're three and 15. It's as simple as that. Like you cannot, South Carolina does not win games. They especially are not going to win a game against a top 10 program if they lose the turnover battle. And especially with where they have it, like the, the situational awareness is something that, that sellers has lacked, especially. You cannot give them a short field. We saw what that looked like last week. Chris Marler locked on Gamecocks. One thing's for sure. Williams Bryce Stadium will be a madhouse. Sandstorm will be going. The towels will be waving. I was in that building the last time, or the only time, South Carolina has beaten Texas A&M. Certainly, that was the recipe to scoring a big home win. We'll see if Carolina can do it again. Chris, appreciate you taking the time as always, man. In case you've been living under a rock, let them know where to check out all your work. Not just locked on Gamecocks, but you're all over the place. Yeah, man, especially emotionally. Um, so, no, it's uh, – We'll I'm, save I'm, that I'm, for another interview. Exactly. We're working out with ESPN and Baton Rouge, um, running social media and video content for them with Matt Moscona and, and um, Hester and T-Bob and all those those guys down there. So next week should be a, a fun one uh, in-house there. Then also doing uh, Cover Crimson with uh, the guys from Next Round Live in Birmingham covering Alabama, uh, Locked on Gamecocks as well. And then on social media, Vern Dumquist on Twitter and our fourth and wrong podcast, you know, buddy Tyler Huck. Chris, you're the man. I appreciate you taking the time. We'll definitely do it again soon. Sounds good, brother. 